Okay, let's do some uh, 10 questions then. And again, okay. some, of, some of these are awful because they're so tough. <laughs> but, nah. um, but your favorite Tom Petty album? If you can only pick, you absolutely can only pick one, what's your favorite? I I guess after a lot of, you know, internal debate and so well, I'll, I'll just <laughs> say that it would be between the, the, I'll tell you who the finalist would be. Yeah. It would be between Full Moon Fever and She's the One. And I guess I would pick Full Moon Fever just because it just, it just, yeah, that's the champion fighter for just song for song. Yeah. I don't know if it can be beat. I don't, you know, the any shortcomings of the sound or anything like that, I think, disappear with the strength of those songs. Yeah. It's an astonishing record. It really is. I mean, like I said, I've, I've talked about this a lot. I just, until I sat down and listened to it with the analytical ear, I didn't realize how dense that album is because it all sounds so simple. Pretty much every song's got at least three guitars, sometimes yeah. four, sometimes five. Like it's, it's right. an incredible piece of production. Like I said, aesthetic aside, Jeff Lynn did an amazing job with those songs, but the songs themselves are just incredible. And they just, again, I think like the Wilburys, from what I understand from Tom reading about Paul Zola's book and whatever, most of those songs came very quickly. Yeah. So to, to have that right. be the output from that is just that's just something special but she's the one I'd, I'd noticed that when we were we were chatting a little bit back and forth i think that's a um, such an underappreciated album i think that one and echo are probably the two in tom's catalog that people don't always pay enough attention to because and I'd, i hadn't either because i thought oh it's a soundtrack album so there's going to be what like two three tom petty songs on there and the rest is going to be instrumental which is fine i like instrumental music but so i never picked it up never listened to it then when i did i discovered walls and i discovered you know, this cover of Lucindy Williams Change the Locks and Climb That Hill and Zero from Outer Space. It's such a great album. Why do you think it is a little bit overlooked? Is it just the soundtrack thing? Yeah, I don't know. I guess so. I mean, I, I know that, that that movie wasn't like overwhelmingly popular or anything. Yeah. Maybe if it was, you know, had been a bigger movie, you know, then it would have been more like, uh, you know, his Into the Wild instead of, you know, it's yeah. just I, I, I don't I've, I got to be honest. I've never seen the movie. I, I've always been curious no. to one of these days I will. <laughs> but but I think that's the record where he's the least petty. I mean, he stretches out the most into songs that would not be like. I don't know. I've never heard anything like um, like some of those songs on that record before. He's, yeah. because, because it is a different thing. It's a soundtrack, I guess. And he's going for a certain aesthetic and. And um, I mean, grew up fast. Like that's he would never write that. That's not a Tom no. Petty song. It's just not. But it is because he wrote it, and it's great. Yeah. It's great. But it's just so out there. It's so different. And um, it's just Full Moon Fever is him at his just most three chord, yeah. simple, you know, simple perfect gem. And then that one is his least petty record that he's ever made. And I think one of the ones he didn't you know, again, reading vibes, it wasn't one that he was enamored of once it was finished. And I think because it was, you know, there was a lot of excellent, it wasn't just the band making a record. There was, you know, you got director pressure and obviously, because it needs to fit within the, the theme of the film. Yeah. But again, what comes out the other end is, it's fantastic. Now, what did you think of the Angel Dream Redux when they re-released it and sort of, you know, they pared down the track listing they took out some of the you know they took out airport and fun, a bunch of stuff that was on the wildflower sessions and then they added in i think it was 13 days 105 degrees was it one life's little mysteries was that on there or there's three songs they added in what did you think of that yeah it i mean you know, the whole to, thing right to me as long as you don't it's it's just like it's just like george lucas do whatever you want with star <laughs> wars but don't make it so we can't find the original anymore yeah so it's like that, you know, as long as I still have my CD of She's the One or that it's still available in its original form, then I think it's yeah. great. You know, it's great to to do, to re-explore, yeah. you know, to do different things, to put out those demos and, and outtakes and stuff like that that nobody would care about except for real fans. And yeah. that's who it's for, you know, like I don't think it's a, I, I don't like it when someone just puts together a new Yo, here's another greatest hits with songs you've already heard that we're just trying to sell you. Yeah. Uh, but when it's an exploration, a deeper exploration or whatever, you know, then it's, or even if it's something that the artist themselves say, I like this better than the way it yeah. was, you know, just like George Lucas, fine, good. Yeah. 
but like, why can't I find the original Star Wars anymore? It's annoying, right? It was, um, it was the same thing when Let It Be came out when McC when they released the the sort of the stripped down version of Let yeah. It Be Naked. I think it was called fantastic, but yeah. I wouldn't want yeah, like you said, I wouldn't want the original cut to go away because they're part of your DNA. And I think you know, I, I just wish they'd release that thing, re-release it on vinyl. We just got Mojo re-released on vinyl. Right, she's the one is you know Canadian. It's upwards of a hundred bucks minimum. Before shipping, yeah. so it's like, okay, yeah, that one back on. on yellow vinyl, please. That would be good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it just yeah, it really did resonate, and and um, and I wish that I'd heard more of those songs live. You know, he didn't tend to play yeah. them too much. I think you know, I, I probably you know, walls. I've heard several times live, and and yeah. and maybe uh, climb that hill once. You know, and and that's about it. Um, yeah, I don't think you good points. I've never actually thought about that. But. Yeah, I don't know if he, I could guess you could go on to Satellite uh, FM and see if he's ever done some of those songs. California, um, maybe that that's probably popped up. Maybe yeah, I think but, probably. Yeah, hope, eh. hope you never zero from outer space. Only ever did grow up, grew up fast. I don't think you could do live really in a heartbreak a set. Right, it'd be a weird, be yeah. a weird sort of down. It'd be a weird lull. Right, and I don't remember him doing one of those things like he did with last dj where he did a few sh shows where they played it from front to back live yeah. uh, i don't recall that having been the case for that one i could be wrong so yeah agreed yeah okay question two mud crutch or traveling wilburys oh well i mean come on like the traveling <laughs> wilburys is any anyone's like uh rock and roll wet dream isn't it i mean <laughs> it doesn't really matter whether it's good or not yeah and it was you know those records are those are cool records uh but it's just like it's just like one of those things where you would fantasize about oh man what if what if that was but that would never happen yeah but like no here it is i just think that doing that kind of thing is such a gift to your fans yeah um of all of those acts, you know, Dylan and the Beatles and Harrison and, you know, it's so, and the fact that they, you know, that they came away with two or three or four all time classics is, uh, absolutely you would hope. I mean, you would hope they would good God, but like, you could also see that just not being the case and that they're just sort of novelty records and that's that, but yeah. I, I don't think they are novelty records or the, Again, I mean, had the egos got in the way and it didn't work, you would have forgiven it because, like, you've got five guys who were, right? Again, just Hall of Fame, nothing to prove to anyone. They didn't need to do that. There's, they've got, you know, no one's saying oh, Jeff Lynn's kind of getting a little bit stayed now or Petty's kind of. No, these are guys at the top of the game, but they get together and it's that love of music again. It's what we talked about, right? Musicians jamming, you know, George Harrison, and Tom Petty getting the ukuleles out at two o'clock in the morning in his house and, and just playing. That's right. what that's what music should be, you know, and, yeah. and they get that comes across that fun and light side of it really comes across in both of those records. More totally. so in the first one, I think. But yeah, and it wasn't even a practical band where they were like, no. okay, well, one of us is a drummer and one of us is a bass player and one of us is, a, you know, there's that great photo where they've all got their Gretsch guitars in their yeah. hand around that tree or whatever, and it's like, no, there's no, there's too many guitars, <laughs> but for sure. And yeah, too many singers. And let's that's get, cool. let's, let's get Kelton. We'll just bring Jim Kelton in, you know, and it'll be fine. He'll be he'll do a good job. So. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I, I guess I, I better give it to Wilburys. But I, I yeah, the Mud Crutch songs are 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 good. You know, I like yeah. I like them. Um, and there's some different sides of his sound. You know, it is it, it's very simple stuff, but yeah. there are it brings some new dimension too. Agree. Not like the Wilburys. Yeah, I mean. I was such a Beatles fan, so anything that Harrison did, and I was my dad was such a Dylan fan. I wasn't as big a Dylan fan at the time. Of course, growing up in England, I knew Jeff Lynn. Everyone knew Jeff Lynn from ELO and all sorts right. of other projects. And then Roy Orbison was just a voice out of like that just it comes from a different planet. That voice, so you know, and Roy Orbison was at that level like Elvis almost, where well, he's right. never going to be a band with anyone, right? But they get Roy Orbison in there, so it's just crazy. Yeah, you hear his voice suddenly appear and it's oh just like God. this wash of like omg you know yeah. uh from a from a different planet but and from a different era yeah yeah and they mix it so well okay so if you could join the heartbreakers on stage for one song what would it be and would you play and sing or would you just play or sing well you know like many musicians my number one goal when i play live 
is just not to screw up um, in a situation <laughs> like that. So I guess I got to just go with jamming me. At least I know it. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> yeah. I've I've played it many times. I can do the backing vocal. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it safe and go with what I know so that I don't make an ass out of myself. <laughs> what do you think of Let Me Up I've Had Enough generally as an album? What's that? Let, Let Me Up I've Had Enough as an album. So Jamming Me sort of was the single and it did hit, I think it hit number one on the rock chart. But otherwise that album was a bit of a, not a, well, it was a flop commercially. It didn't, didn't do well commercially and, and creatively. I think it was that bridging point between the disaster that Southern Accents was on the sort of production side and then getting into Full Moon Fever. But it's this weird space in the catalog where it doesn't seem to fit in either camp. Yeah, no, that's that's right. It seems like a an earlier record in my mind than it was. Yeah, yeah. it's that strange little kind of bridge record between. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. Kind of like reminds me of like Hearts and Bones of Paul Simon. It's like this strange yeah. little record, like right in between stuff that was very distinct and had a lot of you know hits and blah blah blah. Yeah. And then you've got this like thing that's like good. It's good and it's overlooked and I can't say it's a record I listen to a whole lot is the yeah. truth of the matter. Yeah. Um, even to this day, like, you know, I, I came in to him at Full Moon Fever yeah. and beyond. And those are the ones I do tend to listen to more often. Uh, I don't actually listen to his earlier records all that frequently, um, which I should. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're great. Yeah. And I've said this lots on the on the cast too, but I do think that there is a difference between the records that come out after you become a fan of an artist and their back catalogue. Even a, a catalogue as rich as Petty's, when you're waiting for that new record to come out and you hear it for the first time and you're part of everyone listening to it for the first time, your relationship to that music is it's just a little bit different, right? It's a little bit different, a little bit more special, I think. Yeah, yeah, especially when when it's someone that's an you know at is a vital active musician at that time. Yeah. As opposed to discovering uh a band that has been defunct for ages or whatever, then you might just sort of jump yeah. into every part of that band or you know uh and certainly there's some bands that I can't tell you if something is the 70s, 80s, 90s. I I don't know. <laughs> like I'm I don't I'm not familiar enough with their Yeah. you know, with their um I might be familiar with their catalog, but I don't, I can't tell you what came first. Sometimes the recording quality gives it away, of course. Yeah. Um, but, but sometimes it doesn't like you could play me 10 Elvis Costello songs. I, I can't tell you which one came out <laughs> before which one, like I know them all. Neither, I like them, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm not, I don't know. I don't know which, I don't know the eras um, yeah. or what they mean. I just yeah, know definitely. here's 10 good songs. Um, but but Petty, yeah, definitely someone that I, I'd have this distinct, you know, thing in my mind of, yeah. of of which era is which. And sometimes it's just based on fandom and sometimes it's based on, on you know, on more than that. Like, it's not just perception. Like, yeah. like a band like U2, I mean, everything changed when Brian Eno and Daniel Lenoir came in the picture. It's not coincidence that, yeah. you know, that... Uh, my first exposure to them was happened to be right in that era. They really are, you know, fundamentally different records. A, a and different, I'd say the same of Petty. You yeah, know, different with, bands sonically. I mean, Boy and War to Acting Baby, Josh, which I mean, there's, you wouldn't think, that, I mean, apart from Bono's voice being very distinctive, musically, right. if you took the vocal out, you wouldn't think that's the same band at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then there's the Stones, you know, who just, <laughs> they're trucking. just the Stones, and that's that. <laughs> You need the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so who would be your dream opening act at a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers concert? Oh, well, uh, I think I actually saw it. I think I saw it, actually. Most of the time, I'm, I'm not excited about seeing an opening act. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most of the just, you know, because you're, you're, you're going, you're choosing to go to the headliner and the opening act is whoever they might be. I, let's see, like the, when I found out that Mike Campbell was the Who's opening act, I was stoked. Yeah. Um, so I've seen various bands open for Petty and it was all, you know, fine. I thought I saw the Jayhawks. That was good. I saw yeah. Steve Winwood. That was good. Of course, that's a, you know, kind of a bucket list guy, but 
um i don't remember what tour it was it must have been around 2005 um the black crows opened for him and that's a band that i love and i had never seen before so yeah. i was actually stoked about that and and they were awesome like yeah. that is a hell of a show and his voice yeah. is just like right there <laughs> like i could he was a singer that i thought to myself i could see him not being that good live yeah um but wow uh it was great so like that's a great pairing and that's a band that doesn't have to be like steve winwood obviously they don't yeah. have to be opening for anybody like 100%. the black crows is a headline rock and roll act and they do it because they love petty probably you know and they're like well, let us be a part of that absolutely so that was one double pairing that it's not going to get any better than that that was perfect i've always said that i mean apart from you know if i could sound like anyone if i could sing like anyone yeah you kind of think well freddie mercury is my favorite vocus falter but i don't know if i'd want the pressure of that voice right chris robinson i'd kill to have his voice because that guy <laughs> can sing the type of music that i love and i love singing he's the best at it as far as i'm concerned and the crows are again a criminally underrated yeah. rock and roll band like no one yeah. really talks about them when they're talking about great american rock and roll bands and it's a shame because they are amazing i'm a huge fan <laughs> yeah and they got better as they went on i mean yes yeah. that first record is is a seminal album but two three four you know these are great records that are more interesting and creative and yeah yeah that's funny too that's right like you know if, if i think about my favorite singers that's not necessarily the voice that i'd want though because yeah. i want a voice that works with what i do so yeah. i wouldn't you know i wouldn't pick the freddie mercury's either or certain people that it's like you would kill for that voice but it but i don't think it would fit in with my music so maybe i'd go yeah. with someone else yeah yeah if, if you can have freddie mercury's voice you also need to be the creative brain you can write something like good old-fashioned lover boy which i'm not <laughs> so... yeah exactly so yeah there's certain people that i might if i had to trade my voice for uh, there's it might not be uh, my some of my top choices are not my favorite bands or artists but it's like i could see that yeah. voice working for me okay who's your favorite band member other than tom always assuming that tom is your favorite member of the heartbreakers which i've well yeah <laughs> i mean sure but i guess I'll, I will, I'll go with the guy that i have met several times that's only fair so steve yeah. veroni let's let's go with him but but at the end of the day in terms of musical contribution it really is this little collective that you know, yeah. that everybody occupies their their place and does their thing. It it really is a a band band, and uh, and I don't have you know like I don't have a favorite. You know, that question is is good for people who have a favorite Beatle, have a favorite yeah. Stone. You know, but I, I I guess I don't I don't uh, <laughs> okay. I never force myself to think that way, but yeah. but I'll go for Roni because that's the easy answer. Awesome. It's good answer too, though. Like I said, I mean, you've, you've met the guy, you've, you've you know hung with him, you've played with him, so of course you're gonna, of course you're gonna say Steve. Yeah. Um, if you could go to see any Tom Petty concert from history that you weren't at, which one would it be? Yeah. Um, I guess I would go to the one that I'm, you know, kicking myself for not having gone to because, eh, you know, parking's a pain and the tickets are expensive and i'll just catch him next time so i guess i would go to his last show yeah at the hollywood bowl which i i should have but didn't you know i the last show i saw was was the hypnotic eye tour when when uh, winwood was opening and then and yeah. for whatever reason i didn't go catch him at the bowl um in 90 in uh, 2017 i guess yeah so i would do that i would go to the last show i think that's been, if it's not been picked by most people, it's at least been name checked by pretty much everyone I've asked the question to just exactly because of that, right? Because you don't know that you don't know the magnitude of what that last gig actually means that it's the last time we get to see him. And so shortly after, right, we lose him, but it's that, yeah. it, that, that sort of that tension between those two events. It, I don't think we'll ever lose that as fans, right? It's, it's going to be, you would love to see just that one last time. But having said that, like if you go and you don't know, without that knowledge maybe it wouldn't be quite the what quite maybe the but the thing is he's always great and what's what's the thing about him is it's not like i mean obviously with a lot of bands you're gonna you're gonna go to an early show yeah um 
you know, from the who to Van Halen. You want to see these guys when they are just <laughs> kicking ass and yeah. jumping and cr but Petty's not about that. It's not. I don't think he lost anything in getting older. And I, again, I would put the Stones in that same category. They're yeah. not. They weren't. You know, leaping off of risers right. and uh, and pulling off heroics of one kind or another. It's just it's just about the music and the vibe. And so for Petty, I don't feel this great need to go back and see an early show like I like I yeah. would pick for so many other bands. Although, um, although Petty who I didn't the, have the opportunity to see when they yeah. were you know in their younger phase. Well, the heartbreakers of Blondie at the Whiskey, that would have been something. LA debut for both bands, like, holy crap. And I've never been to the Whiskey. And again, it's a bucket list venue, but I can only imagine that the energy in that room when you get sort of a fresh, raw band like that must be incredible. It's a cool place to see a show. And and uh, it's funny, the band I was in, you know, quite a while ago, we had this guitarist who um, was from Tennessee and he idolized Guns N' Roses. Like okay. that was his, and he ended up, he was moving back to Tennessee. He was going to marry his high school sweetheart, all this stuff. And he's like, before I go, can we please play the whiskey? So I'm like, yeah, all right, fuck it, let's do it. So, you know, you have to buy tickets and you have to sell them yourself. It's a big pain in the okay. ass, but I'm like, all right, let's do it. And it was, oh, that's a great place to play. So you, so you played on stage at the Whiskey. I mean, that's yeah. something that, again, I mean, I don't know. I think I think the weight of the history of that place would be <laughs> maybe a little bit too much for me to actually stand on stage and sing there. You know? Yeah, I know. It's it's That's right. Yeah, and obviously the door is cutting their teeth there. And yeah. And um, it was fun. It was a good spot to play. Yeah. Super cool, man. Okay. So, question seven Walls Circus or Walls Number Three? And as a, she's the one fan, you're the perfect guy to ask this to. Which is your favorite version of that song? That's right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll go with, uh, see, with Circus. Yeah, right. for sure. Uh, because, you know, the other one sounds more like just what Petty would do. Yeah. Whereas Circus is a very interesting sonic thing that's a little bit different from the norm, which is what that record, you know, is to me. And I would say the exact same thing about Angel Dream, that the uh, the first version, the one with the weird percussion and stuff like that, right. it's, not, it, it's not just the straight delivery, um, is, uh, is my preferred version of that one too. Yeah, I, I just think they're, they're, they're cooler arrangements. It took me a while to get into Circus just because with the first time I heard three, because, you know, like I said, like you said, it's, that's the way he wrote it for sure, right? Because he, he's written that on, on his Martin. He's sitting there and he's strumming an acoustic guitar. So he's got that sort of singer-songwriter feel. Yeah. But Circus has just got so much swing to it. Like it swings so hard, that version of it. And it's it's got that lazy tempo to it because it's a yep. little bit slower. And it's got it's got that grungy thing in there, and you get all the, it's such a cool the piano and it, just fantastic, yeah, yeah. And the video's great too. It's a, a killer, killer video. So yeah, yeah. And, can, and Lindsay, Lindsay's on there as well. So you you got to love a little bit of Lindsay Buckingham. So absolutely. Okay, this has been my favorite question to ask, um, and especially when you speak to musicians because it throws up some really interesting combinations. So no pressure. Yeah. Um, if you could pick any artist to cover any Tom Petty song, who would it be, and which song would they cover? Well, uh, that's a very fine question. Um, well, I guess, you know, uh, the thing about Tom Petty is that everyone loves him or they're just not familiar with him. He's, yeah. a, you know, he's a very <laughs> beloved character. So it's not like you need to, like, convince people that, oh, you need to like Tom Petty. You need to like his songs. Anyone who's familiar with him, they already do. Right. So I guess the question is, how do you make sure his songs continue to the next generation of music listeners, especially as someone who is unfortunately deceased, which makes it harder. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, is there another answer to that question other than Taylor Swift? I don't think so. <laughs> so, so I got to go with Taylor Swift. I mean, wow. Okay. And what's the she person with the largest audience on planet earth? I figure if she covers a petty song, then there's, a lot of people who just got exposed, uh, you know, quite possibly first exposure. Yeah. But what song? I suppose um, 
she could do just about anything but like what actually sounds like her um higher place okay i could see that being like an early taylor swift song okay but it's I don't got kind of a cute it's like a cute song right it's super simple simple i was just gonna say yeah simple enough yeah yeah not to, not to disparage her musical ability but no not at all yeah. if to do that would be to disparage petty's musical ability yeah. um just because um someone's wheelhouse is simple uh is a is a gift but it but you never you know if you have to if you hear a band and the playing is very simple and you always put your money down that everyone in that band could outplay anybody yeah. you know 100%. but it's not what they're doing in yeah. that particular you know um yeah. so yeah that's a really cool answer because no one's ever With taken unite around petty yeah no one's ever taken that approach to say like oh, you know if we're trying to keep the legacy alive and keep the music alive yeah how do that well yeah i mean taylor swift is she's got like 120 million monthly listeners yeah, on spotify or something insane beyond it's just, massive yeah. yeah very cool um so what song do you most frequently recommend to people who don't know tom's music which again is a bit of a weird question because it sort of depends on the person to a degree i know but yeah that's right and again yeah everyone who knows him likes it yeah so if someone just hadn't heard of him before I, yeah I, I guess uh i guess my instinct would always be to recommend an album over just a song but right. but that's an old way of thinking isn't it um <laughs> thanks to you know spotify and random play and so forth like that so yeah i don't know i mean i guess if someone hears free fall and, and says i don't like that at all then I have a name I can scratch out of my phone book <laughs> and not worry about again. So I guess that's as good an introduction as anything. And, yeah. um, and if they like that, then they, well, like with any artist, there's a whole world of possibility yeah. after that. And that's the fun part about the Apple music and the Spotify for better or worse, wherever you land on it as a musician, as a listener or anything else, Yeah, you know, to be able to do that, deep dive anytime you want uh is cool so yeah that seems like a good gateway song but if i know somebody is less of a singer songwriter person and and more of a you know a rock person then of course maybe i would suggest something else but i'll go with free fallen for the purposes of this conversation yeah and again in one of those songs that you've heard it a million times and yet it's one of those very few songs that I will never turn off because right every time and and can talk about simplicity three chords, the same repeated pattern, verse and chorus is the same pattern. There's no musical bridge. It's just that that snare roll. Like it's so, it's the essence of simplicity. And it's the essence of when Petty did that well. You don't you just don't do it any better than this song. Right, learning to fly would be another one. Right, where it's the same pattern with no real bridge or break, and there's no middle eight. So, but when you do it, when you can write it that well. You know, of course, it's going to be stratospheric. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, that's stuff that most people don't think about, including even musicians. I don't necessarily think about it. doesn't occur to me that there's no middle eight, no bridge, no, yeah. you know, no whatever. And unless I, for some reason, I'm thinking about it. And that, yeah. or, or, of course, if you're going to cover it and you're charting it out for your band, yeah. then, you know, then you see exactly what is or isn't there. Yeah. Um, but, uh yeah, again, you know, doing so much with so little is one of his trademarks. So Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last question in the 10. Describe Tom Petty in three words. Okay. Um, uh, simple, humble, legend. Legend and genius come up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> for a reason right so I yeah think humble, i think humble too i think humble crops up i should do a little um i should do a little pie chart a little hot hot spot thing or a word what do they call them a word cloud i should do <laughs> right right that's right yeah i mean it's that that's what you know when i started to consider him an influence it was the challenge of 
how do you convey so much using as little as you can? Yeah. Um, which was a, a totally different, you know, approach from so many of the people that I was influenced by and still am yeah. before that, who have such complicated, you know, I, yeah. like I'm a huge Billy Joel guy and just yeah. like the way he puts together chords is unlike anyone else, but it's not simple. You would never accuse it of being simple or, yeah. or even the doors. I mean, what are they like? Nine chords, nine different <laughs> chords in the first 10 seconds of light my fire, I would say. <laughs> um, such a different approach uh, yeah. to music from Petty who, who, uh, Yes, there's plenty of three quarter people out there, but but nobody like him. And I'm better. obviously, I'm not accusing him of being a three chord artist because he's got such a wide range yep. of what he can do. But simplicity as a goal, um, and I like complexity. Yeah, I was raised on complexity, and I think it's a great thing. Um, but so is simplicity. It's funny, on another podcast I do, we're currently, well, we just finished up talking about uh, Phil Collins' era Genesis. So you talk about prog. I mean, everyone forgets that Trick of the Tail, Wind and Wuthering, then there were three, Duke, they're all, these are prog records, and Genesis were never simple. So exactly, yeah. exactly what you said. And I mean, that's they, they another do... one of yeah. those bands that was a massive influence when I was in high school and our, on our high school band. We would, yeah. I mean, from the, the whole spectrum, from their first record to their last record, um we were pretty obsessed with with them and so definitely you know steve hackett was a big influence oh. on my playing and yeah um but 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 you know it's, it's a different challenge how do you make something complex and not sound like it yeah is the is just the exact opposite of the petty style thing how do you make something sound how do you make something simple and not sound like it because that's yeah. really it isn't it you you before you pick up the guitar to to check out the chords you you, you want to think to yourself oh you know that's more complicated than it is or that's simpler than it is you know it's yeah. only when you and i mean and yeah billy joel's a master of that you sit down and think like oh no problem i can play like, this <laughs> i don't even know what that first chord is as it turns out or like how did he voice that wow, there's a lot of chords in this song. Like, to, yeah. how could it be? It just sounds so simple. <laughs> um, no, I would never want either, right? You, you want all the shades of the musical spectrum. Like, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to get rid of the simple music. I wouldn't want to get rid of the complex music. I want it all in there. Just, and I want it all taken up different spaces in what I want from music. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's why, you know, nobody that I know of likes just one artist uh, because... Yeah, well, variety is the spice of life, I suppose. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, 